Okay, so this is the third and the last lecture of statistics and energy physics. And uh, I actually reorganized it so it's a little bit more simple than... Uh, it's based on uh, two papers by uh, my student author and me. Actually, both papers are concerning what is called the Lucas effect, which was an open problem to 2010 and we solved it and I'll show what is the problem. If you look in this uh, plot here, this figure here, you see the expected uh, background in dash, and you see the data point, and uh, I ask you if there is a signal. And since it's zoom, and that's the disadvantages of zoom, it's not fun, but still you look and you see somewhere around 30, 30, whatever the unit size, it doesn't matter, you see possible bump and you don't know. Maybe there is a signal, maybe there isn't. Uh, looks like there is a signal at 30. So you can ask yourself, what is the significance of this uh, would-be signal? So in order to know the significance, you actually test the Began hypothesis and ask yourself, what's the probability that this is a fluctuation of the background of the dash line? The smaller this probability, the higher the significance. And to estimate the significance, you use a test statistics, which can be minus two log the likelihood ratio. As usual, downward fluctuation of the background do not serve as an evidence against the background, so we care only about upward fluctuation. So we ask ourselves, at this mass of 30, the fixed test statistics, fixed because we set up a mass, which is 30, is minus two log of the likelihood of the Bergon hypothesis over the global likelihood, which is likelihood of mu s plus b, where we actually, the maximum likelihood is where mu equal mu hat, and then uh, q gets its maximum, and when we estimate Q, the significance is simply the square root of this Q. Have a look at this for a second because this is all that you need to know. This is what we talked about in the last lecture or the, and in the last two lecture. Let me know if there's something not clear here. Please uh, just speak up. Because you have to know this for the rest of the lecture. Katevi, is this clear enough? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So far, it's clear. Because th th that's the main thing here to yeah. remember that the, the test statistics defined as the likelihood ratio of the likelihood of the Began hypothesis defined by the maximum likelihood. Mu hat is an estimation of the signal strength. If it's one, there is a signal. If it's zero, there's no signal. You see, for example, if mu hat is zero, then it's minus two log of one, then it's zero. So the significance of the square root of zero is zero. If mu hat is, is one, then the significant is whatever it is. This is probably a fraction because the likelihood of the denominator is always bigger than the likelihood of the numerator because we maximize the likelihood in the denominator. So this is a fraction. Log of a fraction is a negative number. So minus two log of this is a positive number, which is a significant square. The square root of this is the significant. And this so, uh, for the people who are connected, if something is not clear, please ask, okay? Is there a question there? Of course. Uh, I think there was just a discussion in the background. Okay, so maybe we should ask people to mute. Yeah, uh, yes. Okay, okay. i move on. So, if I look at the distribution of these test statistics without a signal, the distribution of the test statistics without a signal, so I toss Begon experiments only. And for each Begon experiment, there is some fluctuation or there's no fluctuation in this test mass of 30. And I look at the Q0 of this uh, fluctuation, whatever it is, then uh, what was called uh, we had a theorem that uh, 
the behavior of this uh, test statistic, the distribution of this test statistic is chi square with one degree of freedom, Wilkes theorem. And then let's see if now I can actually. Uh, ah, great. Now you see, you see the pen? Yes. Great. So this is the distribution of the test statistics with the background only hypothesis. I toss experiments, toss and toss and toss, many, many, many experiments. And now I look at the, some value of the test statistics of one real data experiment, one real data experiment. I calculate the test statistics for this real data experiments. I get some number. Now, this integration, this blue area here, is the probability that uh, the fluctuation will be as or bigger than the one that we see. So it's the probability to see what we see or even more signal-like. And this is called the p-value. It's given by this integration here. It's this area here. Now, this is when we test a fixed mass and we answer the question, what is the probability to have a fluctuation as or bigger than the observed one? Please, if you have a question, just stop me and ask me. It's not necessarily a long lecture, so you can really stop me. But it's a bit complicated one. So what is the Lucas effect? Here we see a fluctuation of 2.9 sigma. Is there a signal here? Here you see a fluctuation of 2.6 sigma. You see a fluctuation of 3.5 sigma. You can guess that none of them is a signal. These are simply these tosses that I do of background only experiment, and each one has its, uh, has its something like a would be signal, and none is a signal. Of course, it's random fluctuation, but I pick the big ones. All these signals are background fluctuation. Now, since I don't know at which mass the signal is, I don't know. So if I would have seen the fluctuation at 30, I would call it a signal. If I've seen it at 60, I would call it a signal. At 50, I will call it a signal. At 80, I would call it a signal. So the right question is not what we asked before. The right question is what's the probability to have a fluctuation as or bigger than the observed one anywhere in the mass search range, not only at 30 because it could be anywhere in the mass range and I will consider it a signal. So I don't search for a signal at 30, I say search for a signal in a mass range between here and there. So the right question, what's the probability of a fluctuation as or bigger than the observed one in the mass search range? Of course, this probability is bigger than to see a fluctuation at a specific mass, because it's a probability to see it at 20, plus the probability to see it at 30, plus the probability to see it at 40, plus the probability to see it at 50, et cetera, et cetera. So how many probabilities I have to sum? Depends on the mass resolution. So the number of independent regions is actually the search range divided by the mass resolution. So having no idea what a signal might be, there are two equivalent options. So, um, Ilam, they ask if you uh, can use the pointer more um, as you explain so that they can follow. Okay. So, the, uh, so if I ask what is the ability to have, just a second, I want to turn on the air condition. This is Israel. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, so before we ask what's the probability to have fluctuation at 30, now we ask what's the probability to have fluctuation anywhere in the mass range. So it, it's a probability. 
to put it to have it at 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 or 50, 60, 70, 80. So it's a sum of probabilities. So it's bigger than the local probability. So now I want to calculate this uh, global probability. So having no idea where the signal might be, there are two equivalent options to calculate this probability. One of them is to scan the mass range, scan the mass range in predefined steps and perform some sliding windows here and find where well, this fluctuation is the biggest one. The fluctuation is the biggest, it means that the test statistics is maximal. So find the mass where the test statistics gets its maximum. And once you have it, you calculate the p-value. Option two, is to perform a floating mass analysis, which means treat the mass as a random parameter and let the likelihood find not only mu, which max, the signal strength which maximizes the likelihood, but also at a mass m hat, which maximizes the likelihood. So there are two parameters of interest here, sort of. And then calculate the p value. These are the two options. Let's go one by one. Let's start with the sliding windows. You want to scan the mass range and perform a fixed mass analysis on each point. The scan resolution must be less than the signal mass resolution. So the steps must be small enough because I could use the whole region as a, as a, as a window, but that will give me nothing. Sorry? Yes? What if, you, what if the scan resolution is the same as the signal resolution? What if it's that? perfect. The problem is when the mass resolution of the signal is sent 10 GV and you scan in steps of 20, so you will miss fluctuations, right? You will blur them. Yeah. So like these the, these 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 scan res the scan resolution isn't it up to the the analyzer to check to to yeah, choose? Yeah, but you but you you know your detector and your signal. Okay, okay. Usually, 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 especially in the Higgs analysis, the physical width of the signal is much smaller than the detector mass resolution, and you know the detector mass resolution. So usually, but uh, you know, if the signal becomes very, very wide, then uh, the, the, for example, if, the, if, if I look for a Higgs with a mass of a few TeV, then the width of the signal might become bigger than the mass resolution. You have to operate, you, you have to actually use your brain here and your common sense to design it. So for example, here I use a sliding window. So in this window here, I look for the fluctuation. The Q will be very, very small because there's no fluctuation here, you see. I move the window, there is a little bit of a fluctuation here, so the Q will be a little bigger. I move here, now I see a real fluctuation. That will give me my two sigma or something, three sigma. Now there's still, I'm not sure which one is bigger. Move on, now the fluctuation is reduced. And then when I finish doing them all, assume the signal can be only at one place, I pick the mass where the maximum significance, it was somewhere here around 30 as you know. So Q0 float is the maximum of the Q0 when I scan over the mass range. This is the thing you should actually remember. Okay. The option two is simply perform a floating mass analysis. So this is like continuous, scan the region in a continuous way and find actually, uh, this is actually, that's the, 
the minus the likelihood sort of, minus log the likelihood. So you see it gets its minimum here and less minimum here. So the, fluctu the biggest fluctuation is here. It's like the minus Q. Because it's the likelihood, Min not minus two log the likelihood, it's two log the likelihood. Okay, now I perform, I toss many, 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 many Monte Carlo LHC experiments. Each Monte Carlo is one LHC with the luminosity that we are interested in. It could be huge luminosity, so we toss many, many events, which could be small luminosity, depends on the experiment we are planning. And every time with L one, with each LHC simulated experiment, with each LHC simulated experiment, I find the floating test statistics. Meaning the test statistics at some mass in the mass range that is maximizing the likelihood. And what happens is that if I looked at a specific mass, I know that the distribution of Q will be a chi-squared. Chi-squared will be something like this. Chi-squared is one degree of freedom. That's if I look at Q0 at some specific M0. That's the distribution of Q0 at some specific M0. Now the distribution of Q0 it's the maximum mass that maximizes the likelihood since this will always be bigger than this because in some cases m hat will be m0 so they will be equal but in most cases m hat will be different and the test statistics will be bigger because the fluctuation will be bigger so it will be pushed to the right to higher values of the test statistics so this is the distribution, this is the distribution of the floating test statistic. We know the formula for the fixed one, it's a castle in one degree of freedom. We don't know the formula for this. But this is the problem. The distribution of Q float, floating in a mass, given H0, meaning with no signal, given background only experiments, does not follow a castle with two degrees of freedom. This is not a castle with two degrees of freedom. It's um, something between uh, castle with one and two degrees of freedom because the mass parameter M is not defined under the null hypothesis because when there is no signal, when there is no signal, then n equal number of events that we observe is mu s plus b, but there is no signal, mu is zero. And the number of observed events is not dependent on the mass. So the mass parameter is not defined under the null hypothesis because the null hypothesis is n equals b, background only, there's no mass there. Other questions up to now? So let's see. So I have millions of Monte Carlo experiments where I test a fixed mass, cultural in one degree of freedom, or when I test a floating mass, which can be any mass, in any mass at the search range, and I get this thing. And then I go to my data and I do this one experiment. And this one experiment give me some mess. I picked it again to be 30, maybe a, a bit pedagogic example. I should have chosen it different than 30, but I chose it again to be 30. So at 30, at a mess of 30, I find that the floating mass likelihood is the maximum. Now I ask, what is the probability to see 
a fluctuation as the one that I see or bigger at a mass of 30. At a mass of 30, it's the usual fixed blue area. Anywhere in the mass range, I have to take now the distribution of the floating mass and look at the red area. So you see it's bigger as we expected. So I have P fix, the blue area, and P float, the red area. P fix, the integral of FQ0 fix given H0, no signal. P float, the integral of Q0 float given H0. Now the ratio between the red area and the blue area is called the trial number. It's P float over P fix. And the problem that we faced was, can we calculate analytically the floating mass P value? Does anybody, does, does anybody have a question about this figure here? The difference between the red and the blue and what is the meaning of the trial number? And why is the trial number always bigger than one? And what is P float and what is P fix? Yo, well, isn't the trial number always going to be bigger than one because P float is always bigger than P fix? Then, yeah. like, um, a measure of of um, of 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 whether of whether you get a a, a, a larger fluctuation anywhere else um, is it, it means that you have a bigger trial number, and then vice versa means that your trial number is less. Right? It means that always, always the probability to have a fluctuation anywhere is bigger than the probability to have a specific mass. Yes. Because it contains also the probability to have a fluctuation at this specific mass. But if it's closer to one, then that means that, that, that means that- Closer to one, it means that the search range is very, very small. Oh. So there's not really many options for the mass. Okay. So anywhere is also like fixed, it's not really changing. Or that the mass resolution is very, very big and there are not more than one search region or two. That is a very bad detector. So it's like a counting experiment and not like a, uh, not a sophisticated, you can't, you can't have a distribution. You have only one measurement, you count. So you don't have a measurement of the mass. So what, is, what, what does the trial number mean then? The trial number means is the ratio between the floating and the fixed p-value. People thought once something which is wrong, I'll show in a second, and that's where the name probably came from. How many times I have to repeat the, the experiment to cover all the to cover all the, the, the possibilities anywhere. But it turned out that it doesn't really work like that. So I want to define the trial number as the ratio between the P float and the P fix. The ratio between the probability to have it anywhere and the probability to have it at a specific mass. It looks like it's the number of independent search regions. That's the intuition, right? Mm -hmm. How do you pronounce your name, Kola? Yes, Kola. Uh, Kola. <laughs> okay, so you understand that the intuition is that this ratio is the search range over the mass resolution, right? The number yeah. of independent search regions, right? Yeah. But it turned out that it's not like this, and that's really surprising, and that was the surprising thing about the result. But you'll see in a second what happens. Okay, if we got here, and you're still with me, and I didn't lose you. I hope so, because it will be really depressing if I lost you. I can't see how many people. How many people are connected? So some, there are 24 people connected. 24, okay. Yeah. Somebody is asking. Um, no, so I asked myself if only Kola was actually planted by you to ask questions or what? <laughs> no, no. Kola is uh, he's doing a. Uh, He's working with me and, and Simon Connell. Yeah, yeah, I know. So I said, did you plant him to ask me questions no, or no, what? No, no. He's, uh... no, because also last time he asked the question. So. That's right, yes, yeah. 
So somebody asked you, asked you a question here. What about the p-value? So uh, Sole, is, a, is, that, is that how we pronounce your name? Could you it's clarify? It's actually Stacy and Dr. Ketivi. Ah, OK. Could you clarify your question again? So he says, um, um, in the block on the slide, it says, can we calculate analytically the floating mass um, p-value? So I'm asking what exactly is the, the mass p-value that we're looking for? No, we don't look for a mass p-value. We ask for um, a p-value which gives us the probability to have a fluctuation more than the one that we see all over the mass range not only at a specific mass. Now, in order to know this, we need to know the distribution of these test statistics. And this test statistics is made by tossing experiment and each time find the maximum, each time find the, the maximum fluctuation or the smallest p-value. The maximum fluctuation. So what happens is that Every time you toss an experiment, you scan the whole mass range, you find this mass, where the fluctuation is the biggest, this mass where the fluctuation is the biggest, okay? And this is your entry, this is, the, and then you put an entry in the, in the, uh, in the you, you calculate Q for this, and you put an entry in this uh, PDF, probability distribution function. So the mass serves as a parameter. It's, 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 a, it's, it's the parameter under which, it's a nuisance parameter. It's a nuisance parameter because it's undefined under the Bergen only hypothesis. It's a nuisance parameter. There's only one parameter of interest here, which is the signal strength mu. But the mass is a nuisance parameter. And the special thing about the mass that it's a nuisance parameter, which is undefined under the tested hypothesis, which is the Bergen only hypothesis. It's undefined, but yet it changes the whole picture. So you toss experiment, you find the biggest fluctuation, you find the mass with the biggest fluctuation. You don't care what is this mass. You just calculate the test statistic at this mass. You don't care what is this mass. Now you toss another experiment. You find the mass which gives you the biggest fluctuation. You calculate the test statistics. The p-value is the smallest, but the Q is the biggest because the Q is the significance squared. And the bigger the significance, the P value is always the smaller. P value of five gives you 10 to the minus seven P value. P value of two is, the, is 5%. So of course, the bigger the significance, the bigger the fluctuation, the bigger the significance, the bigger the significance, the smaller the P value. But the mess plays only the role, the mess is, a, is like a, a a sleeping uh, parameter. It's not, it's not really seen, it's hidden, it's latent, because you don't care what is this mass that gives you the maximum. Only you care is what is the maximum. What is the maximum test statistics or the smallest p-value? Is this clear to you now? Yes, thank you. Thank you, I'm moving on. So as I said, A maximum fluctuation is the minimum in the likelihood. Okay, that's the way it goes. So the number of minima in the likelihood when I scan over all the mass range should be the mass range divided by the mass resolution. So it looks intuitively that a trial number will be like the number of local minima times the P local. Why pi is the P local? Because the probability to have it at 10, plus the probability to have it at 20, plus the probability to have it at 30, plus, 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 is the probability, it's each time the probability to have it at some low, at some search range. So it's the number of local minima times P local. But this is, happens to be not the case. So again, let's see. The right question is, what's the probability to have a fluctuation as or bigger than the observed one anywhere in the mass range? chain? And I don't care what is the mass. I care at the end, when I look at the data, 
this mass that I see the Higgs, 125, <laughs> that's the mass. But when I ask what is the probability to see fluctuation and declare a discovery, I should ask what is really to see a Higgs like signal anywhere in the mass range. So if the local probability was equivalent to five standard deviation, five sigma, the global probability will probably be something like four sigma, less. And the trial number will be the ratio between the probability to have a four sigma divided by the probability to have a five sigma, which turns out to be something like a hundred. Because five sigma is 10 to the minus seven, four sigma is 10 to the minus five. So four sigma divided by five sigma is 10 to the minus five divided by 10 to the minus seven, which is something like a hundred. So here comes a difficult part of the lecture. Sorry, can I just ask? Um, so with the, with the local probability, right? You, you said that you maybe get a, a local probability of five sigma and then when you look at it in terms of a, like a, a more global mass range, then <clears throat> that, that significance would drop to about four sigma. Like, yes. So with the, with, the, with the local probability, is there, is there, is, is, there a, 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 is it over a smaller mass range um, compared to the global mass range or? Yeah, is it a the local probability is, let's talk about the Higgs. The local probability is at 125 plus minus the two, two something like a two GV or something, plus minus the, the, the mass range there, but it's a, around 125. Or plus minus the width of the Higgs. 125. At 125. Yeah. So sorry, is, is, it, is, is, it, is, it, is it like uh, within, no, it's within not the width of the Higgs? It's not in a window, it's at 125. You ask what is probability, you see the biggest fluctuation at 125. Yeah. That's where the peak is, and you ask what is probability to have fluctuation at 125. That's the local. And the global is to have, I will do the calculation of the Higgs, so give me a second. Okay. I will do it and you will see everything. So I said, the special thing about the mass is simply that it's not a parameter of interest, but it's what we call a nuisance parameter which is undefined under the null hypothesis. So there was a guy in 1987, Davis, which gave us the inspiration to solve the problem. We didn't do a lot after his formula. He said that the global probability, if theta is a nuisance parameter undefined under the null hypothesis, like the mass, then the test statistics, the global test statistics we look is QFM hat, C is the, suppose we see the largest fluctuation at uh, some mass and it's five sigma. So the minus two log of Q at five sigma is five square, is this squared because we know the square root of Q is the significance. So it's 25. So we said, if you look and ask what is the, probability to have a fluctuation all over the theta range or all over the mass range, which is bigger than Z squared, which is the significant squared, let's call it C. Then it's the local probability at this mass point plus something that we look like, like a Martian language to you, which is the expected number of up crossing at the level C. Now let's see what it means. If I look at Q and I do a floating mass analysis in this case here, I see that it has the largest fluctuation here at 30, but then there is fluctuation at 50 and another one at 70, and maybe this. So this is it. Okay. Now, A level C, this is the significance. This is Q at a mass M. Q, 
this is Q at some mass M and this is M. Now this Q of M equal Z squared, the significance squared at this mass. So I can, instead of looking at its axis as a Q, I can look at the significance. So this is five sigma, this is four sigma, and this is a, I'm not sure, zero sigma here. No fluctuation at all. Up crossing depends on the level of the significance that I look at. So you see the number of up crossing where Q is bigger than the level C. So if I look at the level of four sigma, so C is four squared is 16. C, C is Z squared. Ah, oh, sorry. C is Z squared. So for four sigma, C is 16. So I see that at only one place, the test that is it crosses the significance, the significance level. So there's one up crossing. If I look at the level zero, the number of times the test statistics crosses the zero is one, two, three, and that's it. So this is the number of up crossing at the level C. Now, what is the meaning of this average expectation? It means that I toss with Monte Carlo many LHC experiments. At each one, I measure the number of up crossing at the level C, and then I take the average. Now, obviously, in the absence of a signal, the probability to have a five sigma or four sigma fluctuation is very, very small. So as I increase C, it's very rare to get a fluctuation will give you an up crossing. So there'll be less and less up crossing. Oh, shit. Less and less up crossing as I go up in the level C. Less and less up crossing. So that for a significance level, C I remind you is this square, significance square. For C much, much bigger than one, the number of up, the expected number of up crossing is much, much smaller than one. Most cases I won't have a fluctuation of five sigma. Only one to 10 to the seven, one to 10 million, I will have a fluctuation there. So the number of up crossing will be very, very small when the level of C is very, very high. Other questions about this? So how do you determine what value of C, like how do you choose what value of C to use? Uh, that's an easy one. Uh, okay, I want to answer two questions. One that you asked and one that you didn't ask. The one that you ask, you look at the data, you suddenly see a Higgs at 125 with the five sigma, C is 25. Now you attempt to say that you have a five sigma, right? Yeah. But you will say, wait a second, five sigma is if I look at 125. Mm -hmm. So I set C to 25. I go to the formula and I want to calculate the global P value and translate it then to significance. And I will get a P value which is much, much bigger than 10 to the minus seven, which will be translated to a much, much smaller significance. And that's the significance that I would use in order to quote or not to quote a discovery. Actually, this is exactly the reason why when we aim for a discovery, we choose C to be very, very high, say five sigma. That's the magic golden number five sigma because five sigma means C equals 25. And it means that the local p-value is 10 to the minus seven, which is very, very rare, but we know that it will be translated probably to one to 100,000 or something like this. And this is why we start with the local, which is very, very small, with the C, which is very, very high, very, very small p-value with the C, which is very, very high. 
in order that in reality, the global p-value will be accessible, say 100,000 or something like this. So the mm. five sigma is actually a four sigma. So this is actually the whole story in a nutshell. I could finish my lecture here, but I want to show you where is the problem. The problem is that since C, since C is very, very rare to get these fluctuations, if you want to calculate the average number of up crossing when you generate lots of Monte Carlo experiment, in most of them, you will not get five sigma. So you will need a lifetime to generate this. It's impractical, impractical to calculate the number of up crossing with C of 25. We cannot do it. We don't have the computing power to do it. So how do we sort it out? So here's the way we sort it out. So first of all, it turns out by Davis formula, and if I had time, I would convince you intuitively that that is the case, that the number of up crossing at a level C is actually the probability for a Kaiser with two degrees of freedom, the two degrees of freedom in this case are mu and m, to be greater than C. And this is actually proportional to e to the minus C over two. That's mathematics, which can be found in many papers. So, so our formula, P of the global Q more than, greater than C equals P of the local greater than C plus the number of up crossing, simply reduces to something which is more familiar and easier to treat, which is P of chi square one degree greater than C plus some constant, twiddle, twiddle N is, just constant, P of Kaiser with two degrees of freedom more than C. Still, we don't know the constant. What is this twiddle N? I don't know how to write it. I'm so bad, so bad. You won't believe how bad I am in... Uh... So can I just ask uh, maybe a naive question. Is, is, is the mass not a parameter of interest instead of a nuisance? No. Parameter? No, the mass is not a parameter of interest because you don't know the mass. Yeah. It's not a parameter of interest because it's undefined under the background only hypothesis. You test the background. So what is the meaning of a mass? Right? When you want to discover, you test the background hypothesis. So yeah. what's the meaning of a mass? There's no mass in the background. The mass is defined only for the signal. So your parameter of interest is always mu? Yes. In this case, yes. Okay. okay. So here's the trick. The trick is that since we know that the number of up crossing at the level C, is proportional to P of chi square of two degrees of freedom more than C, which is e to the minus C over T, two. We write NC as NC over NC zero times NC zero. C zero is another level, but this time we take it to be very, very small, say one sigma or half a sigma. So the number of up crossing is very big and every time you toss an experiment, you get many up crossing which crosses zero sigma always. So this is something that we can easily calculate. This is something we can empirically determine easily. But how do we determine this ratio? That's easy. It's simply e to the minus c over two over e to the minus c zero over two. So e to, e to the minus c minus c zero over two, this ratio here. So n of c is e to the minus c minus c zero over two times n of c zero. This simple thing was so simple that nobody thought about it before we came into 2010. So simple. So our formula is given by this. The global p-value is given by the local p-value 
plus the number of up crossing at a manageable level of say uh, zero or one standard deviation times e to the minus c minus c zero over two. That's all. That's the only thing you can remember it by heart. It is so simple and so easy to implement. So easy. Okay, this we can actually skip before I show this. Ah, yeah, I, 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 before I go on, I want to say that, okay, now we can calculate the trial number now. Because the trial number is the global divided by the local. Global divided by the local. Now you go to the books and you see that the formula for pi, chi squared did one degree of freedom greater than C, the local is given by this function, square root of two over C, e to the minus C over two over the gamma function of one half. And we already know that P of chi squared two degrees of freedom more than C is e to the minus C over two. So the ratio of both of them, since P global, Oh, sorry. Oh, shit. wait, wait, wait. No, we are not giving it up. Wait, wait. Yeah, okay, since. Uh, P global is P local plus some parameter chi square of two degrees of freedom greater than C. So P global divided by P local, which is the trial number is one, plus the ratio of this thing, P of chi square of two greater than C over P of chi square of one greater than C. And the funny thing, the funny thing, that a square root of C is remained here. And square root of C is simply the significance of the fixed mass. So the trial number is this parameter N, which is proportional to the range divided by the mass resolution. but times the significance that you're observing. If it's five sigma, it's times five. If it's four sigma, it times four. So the bigger the significance, the bigger the Lucas effect, because the bigger is the global p-value and therefore the bigger is the ratio between the global and the local, which is a trial number. Yeah, okay. Before I go, uh, I want to go now to... I'm almost done. So I want to go now to two examples. So if you have a theoretical questions, if you have a theoretical question, this is the time to ask it. If you don't understand something, if you don't understand some derivation, if you don't understand something that I said, just don't be shy, just tell me. Because the only thing you should come out with this lecture is the technique, which I'm gonna now demonstrate to you with two examples. And then I will say a word about the two-dimensional Lucas effect, because we also did this, both experiments. So I will, uh, Give you an example from the most exciting thing that happened after the Higgs, but also most disappointing thing, which was a 750 GV fluctuation with a significance or a local significance, a local significance of four sigma. This is the P local, P local as a function of the mass. And you see that P local at 750 went down to 
something like 310 to the minus five, which was equivalent to 3.9 sigma. Now people ask, okay, four sigma, is this something to write about home? And the answer is no. Why no? Why no? Four sigma is 10 to the minus five. Why, uh, why should I not write home? Because it's not really four sigma, it's less than three sigma, and we'll see in a second. So I remind you the formula. P global at the level U, here I use the letter U instead of C, is P local at the level U, plus instead of uh, brackets, I use the expectation of the number of up crossing at the level U zero, E to the U zero minus U over two. So people looked at this plot here and said, okay, I see a local fluctuation of four sigma at 750 with a local P value of uh, five times 10 to the minus uh, five, P local, five, 10 to the minus five. I think it's less, but I'm not sure. Okay, somewhere here. Yeah, five, 10 to the minus five. So this is zero sigma, one sigma, smaller p-value, two sigmas even further smaller, three sigma, very small, four sigma, very, very small. So you see that uh, one sigma is uh, something like 16%, uh, two sigma is 2.5%, uh, three sigma is whatever, 10 to the minus three, and four sigma is 10 to the minus five, or five, 10 to the minus five. So I want to know what is the global significance when I see a local fluctuation at 750. So P local is five, 10 to the minus five. If I will want to generate lots of Monte Carlo experiments with this level here, I'm lost. I, 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 it will take me days and I don't, actually I don't feel like generate any experiment. I want to use this result and estimate the number of up crossing here and say that I have an ensemble of instead of many, many experiments, only one experiment. What do I pay with? I pay with a statistical error. If I want an expectation of something, I can use only one example. My sample can be made of one member, but then the statistical error of the sample will be huge. And the sample can be 1,000, so the statistical error will be 3%. It can be a square root of 1,000 over 1,000. Or I can uh, do, I don't know, a million. Then the statistical error will be a square root of million divided by 1 million much smaller, et cetera, et cetera. So people use one experiment only instead of a million because they don't care if the uncertainty on this Lucas effect is big. So in this example, at the level zero, the number of up crossing is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, the error on seven is square root of seven, 2.6. Here I lose because if I toss Monte Carlo, I will get a much smaller error because I will take the average of many, many experiments. But I am not patient, okay? U is z squared. 5, 10 to the minus 5 is 3.9 sigma. So u is 3.9 squared is 15.2. So p global is p local, which is 5, 10 to the minus 5, plus the number of up crossing, 7 plus minus 2.6, e to the minus c minus c0 over 2. c is z squared, 3.9 squared is 15.2. 
C0 is zero because the reference level was zero. So it's e to the minus 15.2 over two. If you work this out, you'll get something between 2.2 .2 to 4.8, 10 to the minus three. That's the global p-value, which translates to a z, a global significance of 2.7 plus minus 0.1 sigma. So instead of four sigma, I get 2.7 sigma, which is not something to write home about. Note that I didn't really have to toss any Monte Carlo experiment. This was enough, enough accuration. We got a very small error at the end, translated to something very small. So we are very happy. So, so we answered the question, what's the probability to have a fluctuation of four sigma or more in a mass range, in a mass range of 200 to 2000 GV. Now, you notice something interesting here. This fluctuation has a width. And that can also fluctuate. So, people said, okay, I could also ask the question, what is the probability of a fluctuation at this mass range, but also in a width range? Which could be something like zero to 10% of the mass. And this of course is much bigger than this probability is much bigger because I give more possibilities. The mass range could be, the mass width could be smaller, bigger. I open more possibilities. The width is also undefined under the null hypothesis, the vegan only hypothesis. So this is called the two dimensional local effect. Now I have two parameters undefined under the null hypothesis which is the mass and the width. And it will reduce the significance further on. Higgs discovery. So just a quick question, a naive question, Elam. Um, so what would be an acceptable Z global value? Like if you had observed three sigma, for example, would that have been like, okay, there could be evidence for a signal here. We, we traditionally, we traditionally categorize the nature of the observation to be, of the measurement, of the measurement, to be a discovery or an evidence slash observation based on the local significance. Five sigma will be called discovery, three sigma will be called observation. And that's local significance. So now you imagine yourself, how weak is a statement of observation? Because the local three sigma can easily be reduced to less than a two sigma global, which is really, really weak. It's a few percent probability, so it's really weak. So this is the traditional what we use and this is it. So my question is, okay, so for example, you see a, um, a local p-value that corresponds to a six sigma, which would mean like a discovery. And then you observe, uh, the, the, then the z-global corresponding to that maybe is 4.5 sigma. Would that be acceptable? Or does the that global- be a discovery because the discovery is based on the local significance. Okay. But the reason why we define the local significance for discovery is so low, the p-value so low and the significance so high is because of the local surface, effect, okay? Okay. So Higgs discovery. This is a famous plot from Atlas. So again, the global probability is the local, local, plus the number of up crosses. So, it will be P of chi greater than U, the local, P 
plus this parameter e to the, let's look at this formula because that's actually, that's the one that you're familiar with. P local plus the number of up causing at some low level u0 e to the u0 minus u over two. So we pick u0 to be zero and we count the number of up causing at zero, which is, oh, that's difficult, which is, um, not sure now how do I count it, okay. One, ah, I thought that I'm, okay. Which is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. This is arguably yes or no, maybe 10, maybe not, I'm not sure. So let's take nine because that's the one I took here. Square root of nine is three. So the number of up causing at level zero is nine plus minus three. So P, P global will be nine up causing e to the minus. Now this is five sigma. P value corresponds to five sigma, 10 to the minus seven. So it's e to the minus 25 minus 25 minus zero over two e to the minus 25 over two, plus the local significance 10 to the minus seven, or of 10 to the minus seven. So this turns out to be 3.3 10 to the minus five. This corresponds to something like four sigma. So the Lucas effect reduces the discovery probability of the Higgs from five sigma to four sigma with a trial number of 100. This is it. Can I can I ask a question? Yeah. So how do you how do you determine the mass range over which you calculate you determine ah. you calculate the peak global? Because in the previous slide it was like over like from two hundred to two thousand, whereas here it's like from a hundred to six hundred. Yeah, you can tell me. Okay, let's fix the search range to be from two hundred to two million to two billion, and then the probability to see is almost 100% because I'll see it somewhere, right? But it's yeah. not working like this because there's physics behind it. The, at some point around one TV, the width of the detector is not important anymore. The Higgs width becomes bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So at one point around 10 to 100 TV, the ranges of the resolution becomes huge. So you don't get an infinite range because the relevant, say, search regions become huge and it's not becoming an infinite number of, uh, if you take a range of 10 TV, then between one to 10 TV, you'll have a few, only a few independent search regions. So physics dictates here. But the answer, the direct answer to your question is you use common sense. And every time that you quote a result in a paper, you have to say that this is the search range we'll be, we are using because practically you cannot search in an infinite range, right? You will search in an accessible range. So you quote this range where you search for the Higgs or for the Susie particle, for another exotic particle, it's a lot of effort to do the search and you will say, okay, okay, I search between 200 and 2 TV. Let's be practical. You didn't search between 200 and 2000 TV. It's impractical. You could do it, but you don't do it because you didn't do it. You have to quote really something that you did, not something theoretical. So it's up to you to determine. There's no thumb of rule of what is the search range. It's up to your uh, to your resources. You cannot uh, search anywhere, okay? Now the looks elsewhere effect is becoming diminishing, becoming bigger and bigger and bigger and diminish your results as you increase the search range or you ask other probabilities. Some people even ask philosophically, shouldn't we also ask the question, what is the probability to see the Higgs at a mass of 200 to 1 TV at Atlas or CMS, which is also reduce the significance. So 
there's no limit to this. So what I showed you here is what is common and what people are doing. Uh, a question, Elam, isn't the mass range also constrained by previous experiments? Like that- This is a choice. This is a choice. So you can but choose to ignore- This is a choice and actually it's, uh, I'm sure that Katevi will agree with me that this is a very poor and sad choice. Because, for example, at LEP, we said that there's no Higgs up to 115, and we stopped looking be below 115. So the mass range was uh, between 115, and the standard model Higgs, the upper limit is 300 GV, yet we did search up to 1 TV. But we didn't go below 115. And now people are crying because uh, but when people uh, kind of explore new physics, etc., they suddenly start to imagine that they see hints for, for, for signals below 115, at 90, at 60, at 70, but nobody was looking there. So um, the search end is indeed determined by uh, previous searches, but you have to be very careful with that. Okay, I, I, I still want to spend a minute on uh, another issue. Okay, this, uh, we finish this and then. The 2D local effects. So I already told you what is the thing. The thing is that you can also ask what is the ability to see fluctuation at a specific mass with a specific width. So there are two Newton's parameter undefined under the null hypothesis. So now we look for a PDF of the maximum Q0 where I scan over the mass and the width under the hypothesis, so the PDF will be, of course, different. So we can generalize the problem and say that theta is a um, nuisance parameter undefined under the hypothesis, it can be more than dimension one. So if I look now, let me give you the intuition because we won't have time to go over the mathematics. Here's the intuition. If I have two nuisance parameters undefined under the null hypothesis, okay, I will go back one. Yeah, okay. This is only one parameter, the mass. And this is Q. This is some level. This is an up crossing and this is an up crossing. So you see that uh, this is the, this, oh, sorry. Yeah. These are the places where the Q value went above, went above the tested level, okay? When I have more than one nuisance parameter, like the mass and the weight, so the likelihood will look like a two-dimensional mountains, okay? Two-dimensional mountain. Instead of this thing, like a cut on of the mountain, if I have two nuisance parameter, as a function of the two new parameter, the likelihood will look like, a, like mountains, like a landscape, beautiful landscape. Now a level, a left significance level is, is where I cut at this level here and I see islands. So as funny as it looks like we discovered, okay, not we discovered, a guy by the name Adler from the Technion in Israel discovered in a paper from actually the 1990s that the number of up crossings should be replaced by the number of islands. So these up crossings are replaced by the number of islands when I have more than one dimension. The number of islands is called the Euler characteristic. This is one island, this is two islands, and this is an island with a hole. When there is a hole, you don't count this island. The Euler characteristic is one minus one because the hole is minus one. That's how it's called. So this is Euler characteristic one. It's like one up crossing. That's like two up crossing. And that's like zero up crossing. And the formula is actually we replace the number of up crossing by, by the island. 
And now instead of having uh, another formula is the following. The Euler characteristic, this is the up crossing, the average number of up crossing replaced by the average Euler characteristic or average number of island is a local p value. Now I have two degrees of freedom because I have two, the mass and the weight times the formula gives me some twiddle n1, a parameter which I don't know, twiddle n2, a parameter which I don't know, square root of u, e to the minus u over two. u is the significant square. So now in order to determine the unknown twiddle n1 and twiddle n2, in order to determine them, in order to be able, if I want to calculate the number of up crossing is very high, high level. So I go to two low level, like u equals zero and u equal one. I count the number of islands at u equals zero and u equal one, which is uh, not rare because they are very low levels. And I calculate twiddle n1 and twiddle n2. Here I get n1 is 33 and n2 is 123. And now I simply substitute them in uh, the formula and I can put any level that I want, like five sigma, like four sigma, or whatever that I want, and I get the global p value. So this is from the real experiment from uh, Atlas uh, mass and weight. So you see, this is one island because you can't just like connected here. It's one island, one island, one island, one island. So this is the mass and the weight, the mass versus the weight. I take two level u equal one and u equal zero, calculate the twiddle ends to be four and 0.7 here. <clears throat> and actually now I can calculate my significance and what people discover that what was 3.9 sigma and went down, if you remember, I don't remember what was it to, something like 2.7 sigma. You remember we did it before, 2.7 sigma when we consider only the mass. When you consider both the mass and the weight, this is the islands map that you get. Mass and weight, mass and weight. And the significance dropped down to 2.1 sigma. And that's certainly not something to write home about. And indeed, Atlas never said that the C is sigma. So before I go to the summary, that's a little bit complicated. So I didn't go too much into that. You can search the internet and find the paper. You have the paper reference here, but it's- So, so Ilam, but so then this is, was confirmed with more data, the, the excess just went away by itself, right? It's, it's not- Yeah, of course, with more data, it disappeared completely. Went away. But my point is that, that the, the weird, thing, weird thing about this uh, fluctuation, and this is why Atlas never bothered to, there are two weird things about the fluctuation of 750. One is that CMS didn't really see it. We had to tell them, go and look again. So this is a bad sign already. And the other, the other problem was that, uh, the other problem was that, uh, the width of this signal was, was something very weird. It was something like 40 MeV. It, it was very, very big. And it's uh, not something that we were actually, uh, it, it's not something that, uh, sorry, it was 40, 40 GeV, not MeV. 40 GeV, which is huge, which is yes. huge. The experimental width is a few GeV, and that's 45 GeV. So this is a crazy exotic signal that nobody knows what is this crazy width. And then they said, okay, we should ask the question, what is the width to air fluctuation of four sigma at anywhere in the mass range we look for, but with any possible width between zero to 80 GV, 10% of the mass range or 100 GV. And then the significance went down to 2.1 sigma and there was no reason to write home about but in reality, the real reason was that CMS saw nothing. Yeah. And as I said before, in a real look at surface analysis, you should also take into account was able to see it here or in Atlas in, or in CMS. And when you do this, then the effect of course is reduced and uh, disappears. Mm -hmm. 
So I apologize if the second part was a little bit fake because the mathematics of the 2D is, uh, has to do with something called uh, random fields and it was a bit complicated, too complicated for the purpose. The purpose was very simple and the answer lies in a very simple formula, as you can see, where is the formula? Yeah, yeah, very simple formula, as you can see, which you can easily substitute and calculate. So we saw no, I saw no reason to really go into the mathematics. So here I give you actually the summary with the formulas and you will see the resemblance of the formula. If I have one parameter of interest, which is mu, and one Newton's parameter, which is the mass, undefined under the Bergman hypothesis, then P global is the expectation of the Euler characteristics in one dimension, which is the number of up crossing, which is P of Kaiser in one degree of freedom, the local significance, plus some tweedle N1 e to the minus T over two. And if I have another nuisance parameter undefined under the Bergon hypothesis, then the Euler characteristic this time, or the number of up crossing, the number of islands, this time islands, is the local probability, because with two degrees of freedom here, plus some complicated formula here, with the level U being the level that you observe this uh, fluctuation at this level of four sigma or five sigma or something like this. And twiddle N1 and twiddle N2 are two parameters that you have to determine with low levels of, with low levels of crossings. So the procedure for estimating the p-value is simple and reliable. Alex Reed didn't believe us and uh, generated about uh, 100 billion events and found that these formulas uh, are magically working. The Euler characteristics formula provides a practical way of estimating the local effect. And it's easily expandable to more than one parameter of interest, not only the signal strengths, and more than two nuisance parameters undefined other than our hypothesis. So I hope that uh, you did gain something from these three lectures and you don't find statistics frightening anymore. And uh, I hope that next time that you see, I hope that you will uh, be lucky Ketevi and me will probably be too old for this, but I hope that you will be lucky to see with the new FCC or whatever, uh, something really exciting. And then you will remember that 20 years ago, Elam, who is now an 80 years old, <laughs> old man, uh, taught you something about the local effect and you can easily go and calculate the significance and you know how to do it and you know the proper likelihood and you learned very interesting things and you know how to operate the machinery and you are not afraid of statistics. So thank you. And if you have more questions, uh, you can ask. Uh, thank you, Alam. This is uh, very nice. Um, so um, people have uh, more questions or comments. Okay, they ask during the lectures, I guess this is why. Uh, yeah, I don't see any question in the chat right now. Hey, Ilam, I so like even on this page right now, what about, I mean, the other nuisance parameters that are related to the systematics that does, do you assume that they have been marginalized? If, if, if they only define under the big, under the signal and undefined uh, like, systematics that is uh, signal related, then they can enter into the formula. Ah, uh, okay, yes. But you know, this is really meaningless, right? Yes, yes. Because you don't care, you don't care. You care more about the systematics of Begon and, and, and then if the, if there are, then you don't have a really a problem. It's not local surface. Other systematics simply goes as, a, other systematics simply goes into the formula here as the p-value, the p-local, and they, they, they are very easy to call. This is the, the uh, you use the proper likelihood. Yes, yes, that's right. And, okay. and that's easy. Okay. Um, other questions? So, Ilam, uh, 
could you also explain why it's called look elsewhere effect? Why is that uh, expression used? Uh... Ah, actually, I, I was born into the name. <laughs> I never, I never asked myself, but uh, uh, it's because uh, you don't look at this specific mess, but you look around elsewhere. You look at uh, 10, 20, if you see it at 125, you also look what happens at 100, what looks at 190, you look in other places, you look elsewhere, and that's why it's called the look elsewhere effect. When I look elsewhere, I actually uh, uh, increase the p-value and reduce the significance. Um, other questions or other comments? Okay, so um, I think we can stop there for today. Ailam, thank you very much. So when we do have a the possibility again to, to have in-person uh, meeting, in-person ASP. We'll have uh, Professor Ilam Gross uh, come and give us a lecture. So you have the opportunity to meet yeah, him. Yeah, when, uh, when the APS will resume. <laughs> That's right, yes. Yeah. Hopefully soon, I, I hope, really hope so. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right, thank you very much, Ilam. Uh, thank you very much, bye-bye. All right, guys, thank hey, you. Bye. Uh, Maybe just one question. Are you where do you post the recording? I saw that you're recording. Uh, that's not me, it's a heavy recording. No, they, they are all on the Endico agenda page. Each uh, each oh. Endico agenda has the recording. Okay, perfect. I will post this one as soon as we is is converted into the proper audio format. Then I will upload okay. it. Yeah, so if you go to the Endico of each each lecture, you will see the recording attached there. Perfect. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Bye bye. 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 And thanks, thanks, Ilam, for the Thank nice you. lecture. It's been really Thank great. You. Though Thank I can't bye see bye. that the few statistics has left me, but it's been great. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Bye.